Um, I probably don't need to use this mic, but because we're using the camera. I know it looks like a mobile phone. That's a highly sophisticated camera. It's 1080p, external microphone, input everything. Um, highly recommend it. That's the reason I'm using this anyway. Um, so, Salamikum and welcome. Thanks for making it. This looks a little bit better than it did about two minutes ago. Um, Latecomers, welcome. We just started. Okay, um, I have no idea why you want to spend your spare time attending a, a topic like this. You must be highly motivated. And you must have read up on this stuff too. So who here is studying something related to finance? Hands up, eyes you can. Don't worry, I'm not going to pick on you. I'll pick on everybody. Okay, so I don't know, six, seven people. Okay, um, what we're going to have to do is to start from real basics. Understand what banking is. Uh, understand what's actually happening with the reforms. I'm going to try and make this as interesting as I can. It's a tough gig, but I'll give it a go. Uh, and then we'll look at exactly how this integrates with Islamic principles on finance and banking. And then we'll open it up to the floor um, and see what you guys want to know. Okay. Who here was, uh, who was here last year and attended the lecture I gave last year? One, two, three, four. Okay, these are repeat slides, so I've cheated a little bit, but I assume you've forgotten what I said about 15 minutes after the lecture anyway. Okay, the credit crunch. Everybody knows what the credit crunch is. It happened in 2007. Uh, a rather large financial advisory firm in the States went under, called New Century, I think. Um, filed for bankruptcy, that was the first warning sign. And then Paribas BNP, which is not a far-right bank in Paris, uh, then alerted the world markets to this subprime problem. Can anybody define the subprime problem to me, please? Uh, basically, this is the type of mortgage which used to be given to the people who haven't any good credit history. Yeah. So, by nature, it was risky. Uh, because they are giving those people who haven't got any good credit history. So they ended up with making lot of money. So they are all being disturbed because they invest. there was too much investment from across all over the world, especially from the Europe side. Yeah. So they, when the uh, the mortgages, when the people stopped giving payments to the banks, then the banks suffered, then the investment banks suffered, then the, at the end the investment investors suffered. So okay, we can skip through about 10 slides now. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's, that's pretty accurate. Um, yeah, it's basically people who couldn't afford to pay it back. They were sold products, they were sold mortgages. Uh, but these mortgages were packaged up as being better than they were. And obviously those have value, right? You know, some, if you, a mortgage actually has a market value. You know, when you collect lots of mortgages together, maybe 10, 20,000 of them, it actually, it has, it's an asset, and so it's a big investment. And if you're a large insurance firm or a pension fund or whatever, wouldn't you like a piece of the world's most lucrative market? Of course you would. So that's what happened. And so that's why the epicenter of this is in the USA. And obviously the ripples were felt all over the world. And then we had something which really shouldn't happen in a free market economy. We had state banks rescuing private banks, or the state rescuing private banks. Why shouldn't that happen? It's too big to fail. No, why shouldn't it happen? What's wrong with the state coming in and bailing out a bank? Because it causes conflict of interest between society and business. That's right. In a true free market, if you're a private enterprise, then you live and die by the market, right? If the market conditions are such that you go under, well, that's, that's tough. But unfortunately, the banking sector sits in a very, uh, it sits in an ivory tower, basically, and is very much protected against market forces. Because ultimately, who's paying the cost of the error of 
the banks. Thanks, please. <coughs> you guys. And me. I'm not a banker. Okay. Liquidity crisis simply means there is no money. Banks in turmoil. <coughs> Remember the pictures of the run on Northern Rock? People queuing up outside. Why is it Northern Rock was singled out? Why wasn't there a run on any of the other banks? Does everyone know what I mean by a run on the bank? Okay, everyone's basically going to the bank to get their money out at the same time. That's called a run on the bank. Now that's a problem for banks because banks actually haven't got enough money to give everybody back. That's a whole separate issue. But why Northern Rock? What was the issue in Northern Rock? Well, it was known that the majority of Northern Rock's business was in the mortgage market. And so people knew that the issues related to mortgages, so they, they were very insecure about, uh, about Northern Rock. And the same was the case in the States with Bear Stearns. Anyway, so we had the USA bailout. <coughs> you want to try and follow that through. It basically means a lot of money over here in an attempt to unclog the lack of liquidity in the banking system. The problem for the banks was they didn't really know what, what, what the bad assets were and what the good assets were. They were still trying to find out. So they were very hesitant about doing anything. And the government was under pressure to get the bank system moving because if the bank system isn't moving, then everybody suffers, right? We need money to move, to trade, to do stuff. So that's what the USA did. And then the UK did something slightly more complicated. But basically, we're just trying to flood the banking system with money. And as you know, in this country, Lloyds and RBS are majority owned by the taxpayer, or perhaps not Lloyds, but RBS is 89% owned by the taxpayer, i.e. you and I, money that was meant to be used to fund students, public services, has now gone to pay for the mistakes that ultimately these banks have made. Who remembers the title of last year's talk? Uh, Very good. Yes, so it was don't blame the bankers. And that was a whole different philosophical take on, on the credit crunch. And we're not blaming them because they ultimately acted in their self-interest, but they were culpable to a degree. Okay, global action. So what did different countries do? Is everybody with me so far? Go ahead. Well, what would happen if they didn't? This is what the question. Mm. Well, the bank would collapse, and that would be far, far worse. It would be catastrophic. Sorry. Some people were deciding the for bailing out the bank. Sorry. Yes, of course. Of course, as I was saying at the beginning, in a free market economy, that shouldn't be allowed to happen, but there is no choice. But we'll get on to the reasons why a little bit later. But anyway, here we have the different attitudes that countries took to, to the crisis. You had bailouts in the UK and the US, so basically private institutions being bought by the governments. Um, you had some deposit guarantees taking place at Ireland, Spain, Greece, Germany and Denmark. They decided that, you know what, we're going, instead of people running to the banks to take their money out, we're just going to guarantee 100% whatever's in there. Which is a problem. Why is that a problem? Does it sound like a good move to you? Are you trying to work out what I want to hear? <laughs> of course it sounds like a good idea. If I had my money in a bank which said it's 100% guaranteed, would I want to keep my money there? Yes. But... There's this thing called the European Union. Okay, what happens if Ireland says we're going to guarantee the account? Everybody ships their money to Ireland. Okay, you wouldn't want to do that now, but you'd shift it to Ireland, which kind of imbalances the economy across, across Europe, right? So they were heavily criticised for doing this, and it's very interesting that this created a crack in the Union. It's supposed to be a bloc that thinks together, acts together under European law, but ultimately Ireland said, forget it, we're going to go our own way. And then Germany criticised them, and then a couple of weeks later decided to do the same. 
<laughs> and then Spain and Greece both did it. So that's deposit guarantees. Extra government funding. Russia basically flooded the market with money. Um, and Australia looked to cut interest rates and increase, increase productivity. Anyway. Okay. Why did it happen? No, I'm going to put this one here. Okay, why did it happen? One second. You might get each one of the points. Okay, let's take one by one. Alan Greenspan. What did he have to do with the credit crunch? Yes, sir. Chairman of the Federal Bank. Chairman of the Federal Reserve in the States. Yes. He had to introduce the um, regulations and he didn't do that because he's very pro on no regulations at all. And that's why the crisis accelerated. Yeah, that, that's true. What, what he's responsible for is pretty much what Merv King is responsible for in this country. <coughs> Interest rates. Now, he's, he's the ultimate free marketeer. He's a fundamentalist in that regard. It's nice to call other people fundamentalists sometimes. <laughs> And during his time, he lowered the interest rates to such a, such a point that banks were literally given money for free with a very marginal interest rate. Now, if you give financial institutions millions and billions of pounds, what are they going to do with it? Sorry? Sorry, what do you mean? Yes. Yes, they will risk it, won't they? Because that's their job. A private institution is one which is ultimately responsible to its shareholders. Yeah? Now, what's the role of an executive in a private institution? To increase shareholder value. To make more and more money. So a bank whose job... What, how do banks make money? Interest, yeah, through the sale of debt, services, interest, yeah. So he's, he, uh, he, was at the, he was at the Federal Reserve for 20 years and presided over incredible growth and presided over what effectively is globalization. But he's, he's a little bit of a broken man now because his time just came to an end when the credit crunch hit. And he was considered one of the most powerful men in the world, which he was, because he was in charge of one of the most powerful economies. But if you listen to him now, his assessment of what's happened is, the system is the best that we've got, and this will probably happen again. But there is, there is no alternative. That's quite a scary thought, really. Okay, next person. Clever bankers. Was it their fault the credit crunch happened? To a degree. To a degree. They created products which nobody understood. Not even financial analysts or chief economists. Highly complicated products born out of mathematics where you could risk huge sums of money for a very marginal return, but that marginal return was based on huge sums of money, so it was significant. So you have clever bankers. But most of us associate this with greedy bankers. The types who basically saw a family in the Midwest who couldn't really afford to make repayments realized that they could get them to sign a form which self-certified their income. So ultimately, as a banker, you'd probably be able to justify it to yourself, saying, look, it's up to them to sign the form. I'm not saying they can afford it. I know they can't, but who cares? It's up to them. They sign the form, they're provided with the money, you get your bonus. Totally unethical. And it begs the question as to how you can regulate that kind of behavior. Ultimately, a society which works, in my, this is my personal opinion, is one where people regulate themselves, rather than there being some kind of onerous system where people look to wriggle out of, because people always find a way of wriggling out. Okay, Clinton Bush, why would we blame them? Everybody remember Bill Clinton, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, although I don't know the name of the perfect person to go on 
announce in such policies. For example, the America wanted to increase the home ownership rate by to some extent. And in order to do do that, they in order to do that, the central bank introduced, introduced new regulation in which 1999 they introduced glass seagull air. And technically, this act is all about the coordination of activities of investment bank and the commercial bank. And by nature, the investment bank focuses on the long-term investments and the commercial or the consumer banking focuses on the short-term investments. And one of the main root cause of this credit crunch was the asset liability mismatching. Because in terms of the coordination of both banking activities after the act of 1999, although they were successful in uh, getting the home ownership rate to 68%, but they didn't realize that what will gonna be happen because they have invested in 10 years maturity, even 30 years maturity, 20 years maturity. But they didn't realize that we have the deposits of the short-term investors or the short deposits. And yes, I like that greedy bankers because they know they knew that we have the deposits uh, who are not uh, with, with the aim of long-term investment, but they put it, this deposit into the investment of 30 years maturity, 25 years maturity. And they, when they felt that, or when they faced that, the payments are not coming back to us, and the people who have current account, even the deposit <coughs> on it, but with the short maturity, they want money back, and they which all, all their maturity have been ended. But at that time, they were unable to give their money back. So the credit crunch or the bank run is so all similar that we are not. No, sorry, can I just stop you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what I was looking for was in there. <laughs> I didn't pick it out. Um, debt asset ratio. Ultimately, the way the modern banking system works is based on fractional reserve. We'll get into that a little bit later, but it basically means that there's a certain amount of real money in the in banks, and there's a certain money, amount of fictitious money which is created off the back of it. That probably won't make sense now, but we'll go into it. Bush and Clinton presided over a period where the amount of real money a bank had in its account and the amount it could create increased massively. So you, instead of having something sustainable, according to an economic model, of one pound creates 10 pounds, that's sustainable, by the way, it actually became one pound or one dollar can create $40. And that money then floods its way into society and tries to find some meaning and value. Okay, regulators. We're talking about regulations now, aren't we? Banking reforms. If we had tighter regulation, would that have helped avoid the crunch? Hands up, yes? You have to put your hand up to yes or no. <laughs> okay. Uh, who says no? Regulation what <laughs> The banks themselves. The financial sector. Okay. Uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, the largest provider or largest owner of mortgages in the States. They had something like 260 regulators pouring over them during the point at which the credit crunch hit. It didn't do them any good. And ultimately, who provides who provides regulation? Who? Government. Sorry? Government. Government. Now, what reputation do public institutions have? The inefficient. Yeah, that's the one I was looking for. <laughs> Inefficient. Staff not really motivated. Everyone's there for a nice little ride and a great pension. Yeah, sorry, you have a question? You said, is, would, it, would the prices have been allowed to get be better regulation? But you're just saying there's more regulators, not that the tools that they use to regulate the people are better. Yeah, it's a, it's a crude example, you're right. Um, 
Ultimately, regulation hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. Because you have a cycle of tight regulation and loose regulation. The banks and financial institutions use their political power in order to deregulate the market. Why do you think it is people can self-certify? People who didn't have any money could gain access to a lot of money. That didn't happen by chance. It was work towards. And then when things happen like they do now, people start calling for more regulation, which is why the banking reforms that are coming in, people are looking very closely at, and we will get to those. Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations. Should we blame him? No. No, that wouldn't be fair, would it? <laughs> he's the father of economics. He's the one, he's a Scotsman who wrote a 900 page yeah. book called the Wealth of Nations, from which most of, um, most of modern economy is, is derived from. The World Trade Organization, anybody been on a march? No? You could blame them. The corporate body, it's possible that there are problems with the corporate body which increase borrowing. Estate agents, should we blame them? We'd like to. Uh, Satan or Darren Brown? Why? Why, why Satan? Uh, more serious point, how about you and I? Let's put yourself in the position of a family that cannot afford to make repayments on money that's been offered to you. Hands up if you take the money. Come on. What's the question? If you're offered money, what do you think then? If you are, if you're in a position, okay, I assume nobody here is married. Okay. Kids? Okay, right, okay. Um, let's say you're all married, so think forward. About six months. <laughs> um, Hey, it's university is the best time. Afterwards, it gets far more complicated. Um, so you're married, you've got children, you're living in a bad part of town, and there's money on the table for you to move to a good part of town where there are good schools and it's a nice neighbourhood. Are you going to take the money? Yes. No. yes. No. Yeah. Hands up, yes? <laughs> What's the, call? What's the question? Where are the ears? You need to take that hat off. Okay, and who would it? Okay. Uh, okay, it's interesting because people are in a very desperate situation. Very, very desperate situation. And they see everybody else, it's herd mentality, isn't it? Everybody else is moving on, getting by. And they're not doing things that you really, ex you know, they're not extravagant things. They're just buying themselves a home. That's all they're doing, and they're moving to a decent part of town. And when you've got kids, that's, that's what you want. That's your priority. So to blame people for that behavior, yes, they are culpable to an extent, but you can understand why people have behaved in that way. Ultimately, we have a, a, an econ economic system of the haves and the have-nots. And that gap is getting wider all the time. If you're part of the have-nots, you feel un you're unfairly represented, or you're not represented. So therefore, you'll do what you can to get by. OK. So maybe it's, maybe it's some of these things, maybe it's all of these things. But maybe we need to look a level slightly deeper. Maybe these are the symptoms and not the cause. Maybe there's a systemic problem. So what did go wrong with the system? Well, the Independent Commission on Banking, ICB, was established around 2008, maybe early nine, and it's headed up by Sir John Vickers. Uh, the interim report is through, and the final paper will be issued in September. Actually, the interim report will be in April, and the final one will be issued in September. Now, I'm not going to bore you with this, yeah, because it seriously can be dry. But there are three aims to this commission, okay? This is what we're here for. Time to focus. 
Maintain the flow of credit to the real economy. <coughs> Hardly surprising, isn't it? It's not rocket science. Increase the resilience of the financial system. And facilitate greater competition, especially in retail banking. Who are the main retail banks? HSBC, Lloyd's, Barclays, Lloyd's, RBS, RBS which, which, which owns now West. Right? So these are the three key aims of that commission. So how are they going about it and what have they identified so far? Well, in a, um, in a statement made by John Vickers in January 2010, these are some of the things that we could draw out of what he said. He's looking for an increased protection in retail banking. Retail banking being the kind of banking you and I would use. Whereas investment banking is more wholesale banking, it's banking between businesses. That wasn't really a problem. Liquidity in that market wasn't really a problem. But when it came to retail banking, there were some serious issues. Managing externalities. Like for example, businesses that pay interests that interest is tax deductible on that business, which makes the cost of that equity, it increases the cost of the equity in the market. So these are externalities. This is the tax system, which is outside of the banking frame, which is causing problems. So they're looking at that. Uh, they're looking for an international consensus. Why is an international consensus important? Because a lot of Banking trade happens across countries, so if they get support from abroad, then it will, if there's any external threat like from other countries, it will also be applied there. Ultimately, the financial markets are global. Yeah, they're, they're global markets, you can't act independently. It's a little bit like what's happening with Libya at the moment. You know, David Cameron's like, we're having a no-fly zone, and America's saying, well, no, we're not. And then he's having to say, actually, no, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same. You need an international consensus for anything to work. We're totally globalized now. Um, risk management, obviously. Banks are there to, well, they're supposed to be there to manage risk, and they haven't actually done it very well. So what can be done there? <coughs> Failure management. So they're not discounting the possibility that a bank may fail. Okay, fair enough, it is a private institution. But they need to make sure it fails nicely. It fails in a way which doesn't affect us in the way that it has. And that's, that's a welcome part of it. Um, and they're looking at things like contingent capital. Basically, banks put money to one side, and they need certain triggers in the economy which release that capital in order to blah, blah. Okay. Right. So the big question is, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but we just sneak in there, huh? <laughs> okay. Is the commission dealing with the symptoms or the cause? Open forum. Yes. Is it the symptoms? Symptoms? Well, we all say at the same time. Symptoms. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, a little bit more. Yeah. You know, why, why are they dealing with symptoms? Because of course. something like this on the front 99 is a small scale. It was caused by a, a small credit card. So they, they, they put up some reforms that oh, we're doing this because that. Now this things happen and they say, oh, we're doing a committee. That's all, you know, aside from Okay. Sorry. I was going to say the crisis will repeat and repeat, like, for example, our green fund said, and what we have to do is we have to alter the way the system works. It's very difficult because I think the whole financial system should be completely demolished. Okay, that's radical. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you've got the tent. It'll be chaos. Yes. Yeah, you could um, maybe we'll set out to possibly come to this at some point. I'll give you a test. Capitalism and interest. Okay, well, that's where we're headed with this. Ultimately, we're, we're looking at this from the ethical stroke Islamic perspective. Okay? Is enough being done? I think you know the answer is no. And it does deal with the symptoms. Okay. 
let's just go back to basics and understand exactly what banking is. Apologies if this is a little bit too basic. They make money through the creation of money, the sale of debt and services, and the charging of interest. How do they create money? They have a license to do so. Okay? They have a license to do so depending upon what the asset to debt ratio is at that point in time. So these banks borrow from each other. They ultimately borrow from the Bank of England. The Bank of England has its base rate, and then they know what to charge on top of that to make a profit in terms of interest. They also have services. Yeah, they have services which are legitimate services. I'm sure you've all used PayPal. And yeah, they snip a little bit of that transaction fee up and make some good money out of it. But ultimately, that's how banks make their money. There are two key areas here where there is a problem from an ethical and Islamic perspective. What are they? Interest. Interest is one. Money creation. What's the problem with that from an Islamic perspective? But ultimately, it's not money. It's called money. Does it? This is a key point. Does everybody get this? Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> when you put ten pounds in the bank, the bank now has ten pounds. It can then create another ninety at least. But the height of the credit crunch is maybe twenty, thirty times that amount simply by tapping into a computer, and then send that money out as a loan. Who here thinks banks have money to loan you? I'm trying to work out what the answer is, aren't you? Money as in actual money. Right? Actual money. No, they don't. They don't have money to loan you. But they can contract you to debt. It's a subtle difference, right? So again, let's take you into the future, married, kids, going for that house. You go to the bank and you say, I'd like to borrow 250,000 pounds, please. Now the bank doesn't have 250,000 pounds to loan you. So how does it give it to you? Because you promised to pay it back to them before they create it. That's your mortgage contract. You understand? So you've signed a contract to say that you owe the bank. £250,000 plus interest over 25 years, which ultimately will make that £500,000. And because you promised to pay, the bank looks at its asset liability allocation and says, yeah, we can create that much money and we can give that to you and put it into your account. Does that make sense? It takes some getting around, but ultimately the banks don't have money to lend you until you commit to paying it back. Okay, this is just a bit of fun, really, because we like to poke fun at the bankers, and it normally helps if you know how much money they're making. Sorry, I understand what you just said, but how is that understanding? Okay. Which bit? Well, you said that the, you said that the creation of money is understanding. Yeah, ultimately, in an equitable system, one based on equity, not debt, you wouldn't create money out of nothing. You know, ultimately, if I gave you ten pounds now, wow. it's worth something because you believe it's worth something. But ultimately, it's just a piece of paper. It has no asset backing. If you go back into the early banking days, it used to be a one-to-one -one thing. Um, apologies if you guys know this, but uh, was it the 16th century? Uh, the goldsmiths would create shelves and a vault, and those shelves are called banks, and they would store their gold. In and then ultimately the other villagers would come along and they would say, well, can you look after our gold because there's a lot of bandits about. So they said, fine, and here's a receipt. Those receipts corresponded to the gold. So those receipts were worth exactly what the gold was worth. Now, because it was difficult to trade in gold, you know, and rubies and whatever else these people carried around, rubies, <laughs> okay. uh, people started trading these receipts. And so the bankers noticed that they were trading these receipts in the market, okay? So the banker started to loan his own gold out via these receipts to gain interest and used to loan other people's gold out without them knowing in order to gain interest. Then he realized, you know, nobody else is actually coming back for this gold. Nobody actually knows how much gold there is here. So I'm just going to write fictitious receipts and send them out to society. Now, does that sound right to you? No, no that's fraud. <laughs> that's fraud. 
But interestingly, <laughs> history is very interesting in that there came a time when there was a huge European expansion, colonial expansion, and it needed to be financed. And ultimately, the system of fraud was regulated, and it became legitimate. And that's what we have today. Okay, HSBC, 2009, 5.8 billion. 4.6 for Barclays, minus 6.2 billion for Lloyd's, and we, the taxpayer, did not make 15 billion. So what do we think HSBC made in 2010? One. More or less? Less. More. 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 Yes. More. Yes. More. Okay. They all did okay. HSBC have just declared profits of just under 12 billion. Barclays, six. Uh, Lloyd's, uh, which, which we own mostly. They just made two and a half. And RBS, <coughs> poor old RBS, still loss making. But you know what that figure was in 2008? 24. Yeah, who said 24? Yeah. You were listening. <laughs> 20, minus 24. So these bankers are not bad, are they? I mean, look, look what they're doing in the markets. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? Or is banking money for old rope? Ultimately, who doesn't need banking? Yeah. Is it really that hard of a job to run a bank profitably? I think they've shown that it's not really an issue. Okay. So what are the systemic flaws? Okay, so obviously the concept of interest. There are a whole variety of problems with interest. I mean, from a rational economic perspective, you could look at various studies that will demonstrate how can run an economy based on interest. And actually, if you look at the Western world, and actually much of the world now, you could argue that, well, it's not doing so badly. Well, it wasn't up until a point in time. But ultimately, the problem with interest, as you can see in the most developed countries in the world, is that it does create the haves and the have-nots. Why does it do that? Because in order to get a loan, what do you need? Collateral, you need assets. You need assets. So ultimately, it's people who have, who have access to more. And people who haven't, struggle. You know, when you're getting that little nest egg together of 20, 30,000 pounds put down on the house, it's a struggle, isn't it? Yes? Is it like the concept of interest? It's like, if you think about it, it's a very you know, crazy, because how can you price time? It's like, interest is a price in time. Okay, you can price an asset. But how much is using? You know, there are all sorts of modules, models. But how can you price time? The internet is pricing time. I mean, how do you know what's going to go in the future? Uh, that's a good point. There's an additional issue here. Now, get your heads around this one. You thought banks not having money was complicated. You know, when you get, you sign the, the mortgage application for two hundred and fifty thousand. That all you're given is 250,000, right? That's what's created digitally, right? But what do you owe the bank? You owe the bank more than 250,000, don't you? Yes. Over the 25 year period, that possibly is going to become 500,000? Okay, where does that additional 250,000 come from to pay it off? They will combine the interest rate, because for example, like a mortgage of 250,000, like pay deposit. Installment. So by principle, it should be the interest should be given to the minimum amount. But it's not. That's right. The, the question though is, 250 has been digitally created. You actually owe double the amount. So where, if it doesn't actually exist, if the money doesn't actually exist, how how is how are you going to pay it off? Where does that money come from? That additional 250 thousand that's needed. That's the right answer. More loans, more money is created and flooded into the market. Does that make sense? It's like a time lag. It's like a debt bubble. This is a debt-based economy. It's not based on equity. It's based on debt. The sale of debt, the creation of debt, new debt to service old debt. Does that make sense? And that's what's happening over time. 
And it's only the time difference between your actual uh, principal amount and your repayments which keeps the system afloat to an extent, but there's always people falling off it. And the economy is doing its best when the least people are falling off that conveyor belt. And at the moment, nobody's staying on the conveyor belt. Fractional reserve, we've already spoken about money creation. Bailouts and privatized banks. Um, that's obviously a flaw. How the hell, excuse the expression, can, can we be expected to pick up the tab of basically totally unethical behavior by a protected species, a despised protected species? Now, does anybody want to be a banker here? The guy who sneaked in at the back, <laughs> late, it figures. <laughs> that can't be allowed to happen. That's a systemic problem. Corporate governance. How many executives have been jailed? One. One? Yeah, one. That's about it. There are a few. Ultimately, I think there's more than a few who are culpable here. There's a great film out at the moment called Inside Job. Yeah? There's a great, great, great film out or inside job, which if you are interested in how this happened, it's basically a little bit Michael Moorish, but without the jokes. It's very, very watchable, very interesting. It's on at mainstream cinemas. I would recommend you go and watch that because basically you get these executives squirming in their seats, which is very, very interesting to see and losing their rag. So corporate governance needs to be handled better. And ultimately, this is an economy based on debt and interest. Debt, 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 bubble. Get bigger and bigger and bigger. A bubble's always going to pop at some point. Okay, so where's the Islam in this presentation? We get there in the end. Okay. Oh, that's far too slow. <laughs> Interest abolished. Actually, interestingly, Islamic finance is one of one of those areas of the Islamic faith where nobody has a problem. Everybody buys into these principles. Even the BNP. Anybody hear that? <laughs> I've heard Nick Griffin say it with his own mouth. Yeah, I suppose a credit crunch wouldn't have happened under Islamic financial principles. Yeah. Did he say that? It was on question time, wasn't it? Yeah, I felt sorry for everyone there, didn't you? Okay. No fictitious money. Real money. Real money that's worth something. Now there's an argument that if you're only putting in money that's worth something into the economy, then you're stunting the growth of the economy. Because if you have one pound, and you're actually putting ten pounds into the economy, that's creating growth. A faster pace of growth. There's more liquidity in the market. But ultimately, where has that got us? Where has that race for growth got us? It's not been sustainable, has it? Ultimately, if you want a sustainable economic system, it has to be based on a one-to-one -one ratio. Yeah, between assets and liabilities. Equitable risk and return. Okay. Instead of financial institutions lending money, what do they do? They actually partake in risk. Because at the moment, they don't really partake in risk, right? They just lend money. If your business does well, they get their interest payments. If your business collapses, they still get their interest payments. So there's no risk there, really. So under an Islamic or ethical financial model, what you'd have is you'd have the bank, instead of asking you what you own, who here wants to start a business when, when they graduate? Okay. You're going to need capital to do that, right? Are you going to need capital? Yeah, lots of capital. Sorry? Uh, yeah, a lot. Okay. <laughs> so ultimately, you're going to have to either get that privately or go to a financial institution to do it. Now, if you go to a financial institution today, they'll want to leverage off the back of your assets. Yeah? If you go to a financial institution where it's equitable, they'll want to know more about you. What experience do you have? What's your track record? 
you come from a good family, that kind of stuff, yeah? Same kind of like marriage, really. 